final session of the Open Programming Mini-Conf. And as I've been mentioning all day, uh, this is reserved for lightning talks. For those of you who haven't seen lightning talks before, these are five minute talks presented by whoever wants to sign up on the day. Um, we take no responsibility for the um, um, for what people have signed up for. Uh, it's just whoever put their names on the wiki. Um, basically, rules are this. You have five minutes. Uh, this includes the time taken to plug in your laptop. So if your, um, if your graphics if your graphics settings don't agree with the projector, uh, it's your problem. OK, the timer will start whenever I see fit. OK, so whenever I click the start button, that's when your five minutes start. And you can see the timer on this big screen here where it says start. Our first presenter is Tim Ansell. Please make him welcome. There's your microphone. Go. So everybody knows the only language you should ever write anything in is Python. Um, <laughs> as everybody in the audience um, knows. So we have this conference called PyCon AU and it's dedicated to Python. So if you write in Python, you should come along. Um, it's run by a group of volunteers like LA, uh, like LCA, um, and it's um, the parent organization is Linux Australia. Um, it's run on the 24th and, sorry, the 20th and the 21st of August in the Sydney Masonic Centre. Um, yeah, that's kind of all I've got to say about it. Um, it's an awesome conference. We had 200 people last year. We sold out. Um, if you could spread the word. Last year we had people kind of turn up and say, I only found out about PyCon AU like yesterday. Can I come in? And we had to say no. Um, so please tell all your friends about the conference. Um, we're going to be bigger and better this year. And my mic's getting replaced. Um, tweet about it. Um, if you click on the spread the word link there, it will give you a flyer that you can print out and put up around your universities. Join the mailing list. I'm trying to click it, but it's quite hard. <laughs> <laughs> on your own computer. Um, yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, we have lots of different topics, um, computer games, um, web development, um, I've got like, Python, they're all Python related, um, anything from community stuff, um, yeah, it's like any other questions, I've got like, Two and a half minutes. I could stand around and dance, but dance, please. No. <laughs> Why is Python the best? Because it's it not is. LCA is. Um, Both. Python three is on schedule. Yes. Um, okay. Well, I'll let you go to the next person. Please come. It's an awesome conference. It's quite cheap, especially if you're a student. Um, we have discounted student tickets, so please do come along. We've tried to make it really accessible to um, people which have limited finance. So please come along. It's awesome. Thank you very much. OK, so up next we have uh, Ivan Miljanovic. And your time starts now. So my name is Ivan. I'm here to talk about Haskell. I don't have any slides partially because I forgot to bring my laptop's power cable today and it died already. So we had a talk earlier from Brian about F sharp. Haskell, like F sharp, is a functional language. It's a purely functional language. Whilst that means it doesn't have I/O, I mean, it doesn't have OO. Sorry, it does have I/O. Um, by pure, we mean that we do not have mu that mutability is constrained by default using these weird things called monads, which Brian also mentioned. 
Monads, despite what a lot of people seem on the internet seem to think, are not this scary thing. After all, there are only monoids in the category of endofunctors. <laughs> no, okay, not really. You don't. Have, despite the fact that we use a lot of category theory terms and terminology, that's just mainly because we have no idea what else to call them, and we've got the idea from math, so we might as well use the mathematical terms. Um, so the whole point about the pure aspect is. You have side effects, great, constrain them into I.O., into S.T., whatever monitor you're using. That way it's easy to see which bits are going to change because of mutability that you don't know what's going on. And so it's a lot more easier to reason and perform aggressive optimizations on the code uh, when you can guarantee its purity. Haskell is a rather ad hoc community-based programming language. We don't have benevolent dictators for life or any kind. Um, so basically, it's, it's, it's more of an anarchy. We have a, a bunch of people suddenly going, the website's not working, let's try and form a committee to keep it going. That kind of a thing. Uh, more recently, we finally decided we should update the language officially from the old Haskell 98 standard. The first version came out last year with a few new changes. No one got around to doing it this year, so next year they're thinking, maybe we should get some people together and consider breaking backwards compatibility and fix up some of the hierarchical messes we've got going on. Um, and so we have a fair number of libraries available on Hackage, which is our equivalent of CPAN or whatnot, um, and some quite interesting attempts at solving various problems. Now, there are various uh, hackathons that people have organised in America and Europe. Only recently have we started to do anything in the Southern Hemisphere. There is a couple of functional programming groups in Asia and also in Australia, but they're typically not Haskell, just, ha just about Haskell, they're about Scala, F Sharp and other than the like. Uh, last year, however, myself and a few other people decided we'd had enough of not being able to attend any of these hackathons and organise the first ever OzHack, which was held in Sydney, despite the fact that all of us organising it are from Canberra, because Sydney's got the vast majority of Haskell programmers in Australia. We're looking at holding another one again this year. We haven't yet organised it. If you're interested in coming along, and we, ha we welcome people who've never used Haskell before as well, uh, join us on the haskell.au IRC channel on Freenode. We still have, we're still trying to work out whether we should change the format to maybe do a bit more of a Rails camp kind of a thing with limited internet access to stop us from all from talking on IRC instead of programming. So that's all from me. Okay, so next up we have Peter Miller. And luckily our previous talk finished before the, pre the other projector decided to switch itself off. Okay, he's attempted to plug his laptop in, so he starts now. Yeehaw. <laughs> so uh, I want to boost LibExplain. I'd love people to use it and give me some feedback. LibExplain is a library of system call specific error replacements. Uh, so I'm going to do a live demo. Uh, just a minute while I zoom the text. So this example is in the source code for libexplain. It is a very dumb cat replacement. Uh, and it has full um, error detection and handling. And it is very short. It has one feature that I wanted to show you in that it has a minus O for output. All of these are using the system calls all have also come with a wrapper function so that you can say F reopen or die um, using the, the borrowing from Perl. So I have some examples of this program in action. So there we have uh, the sort of error message you're going to get. It reproduces the syscall so that you've got as much information as possible for users to cut and paste and glue into the bug report you're going to read three months later when the machine's unavailable. The reason I wrote libexplain was in 2008 I was supposed to be level infinity tech support and never talk to users. And I still had a queue of people asking me to explain the latest um, Oh, no result, please. So I got sick of that and decided to put all of the things that I was checking into a program. And 
I put a little bit of useful stuff in it so that it could make suggestions when they'd made simple typos. Um, and here's an example of it trying to guess what you may have meant. Um, so another example. This one, this time, is it cut it off on the right hand side? Yeah. Oh, drat. Um, Let's try that again. Still slightly too big. Here we go. A bit too big still more. Just keep going until it says salt. Okay. Salt. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. It has lost the size of the terminal. It normally wraps quite nicely. Um, Anyway, you see an example here where it is actually complaining about a particular file system and it goes and it finds the file system out of um, FTAB, FSTAB and tells you about it. Uh, trying to supply you with all the information you needed um, and some you didn't know you needed. So let's... I hope you can read that. So now we have an example of trying to write to set password or a file you don't have to write permission to. And it tries to explain to the user just what exactly went wrong. Because one of the things I found is nobody understands the permission system, um, except really nerdy people who are expecting and indeed require in their daily life rigid consistency. Um, normal people don't expect that, and uh, they get confused. So. The last demo I wanted to give you was I set this file system up very carefully so that it's already run out of space. But this time, in previous examples, the minus O, the executable actually was given the string of the path name. In this case, bash is going to open the file for it and pass it as std out. Now, the thing you need to note is it still worked out the name of the file that it was never given? That's very good. OK? And it tells you which file system it was on. So libexplain tries to tell you everything you needed to know and the stuff you didn't know to ask. OK? libexplain, try it. Thank you. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Up next, we have Nick Hodge. He's attempted to plug his laptop in. He starts now. <laughs> so it will just work. <laughs> OK, so uh, we have a crisis in our industry, a programming language crisis. So as, uh, as mentioned, uh, firstly, I am from Microsoft, so therefore I am one of these evil basement cats coming along into your conference, and evil is escaping. Uh, for all, one of the things I'd like to point out, this is an obscure 1994 joke that uh, Intel has a patent on these two numbers. If you divide one by the other on certain Pentium machines, it gives you the wrong answer. Anyway, that's an obscure 1994 joke. Um, uh, and therefore, what Microsoft decided to do is we're taking a patent out on this number, um, so it belongs to us. So no one can use it. You can have it. <laughs> OK, so let's take the tinfoil hats off for the moment and uh, move into a little bit of what the crisis is. Firstly, our industry, and I, how many, there's not many females in the room here right now, we ignore them, and this is one of the worst things about our industry. There are not enough women in our industry. Considering it was started by Lady Ada Lovelace, uh, Admiral Grace Hopper gave us a lot of really good t things in the 50s and the 60s, and if you read the history of Algol and, uh, and algorithms and stuff, this lady called Rhea Debetz did some awesome work, but they get forgotten. And this is not sort of unfamiliar in our world. 
You know, we had the Y2K crisis that happened about 11 years ago. We had all those COBOL programmers that we had to sort of get out of the grave and reanimate to come and fix up all the problems that they originally coded. So they earned, you know, $3,000 an hour and, you know, to come and fix things. Um, and then we have the problem with Gen X, which is sort of, I would say, the majority of the people in the audience right now. You know, basically, you know, VB is perfect. Yeah, let's build everything in VB uh, and learn on VB. That's, that's wonderful. Great. And then, you know, because that didn't work so well, then invented C Sharp and Java and, you know, all quite cool. But, you know, really the problem is that, huh, well, well, then we have JavaScript, Let, let's not go there, um, it's just evil, um, uh, is that, you know, the modern day languages that we're trying to solve our problems with, whether they be, you know, PHP with a dollar sign in front of variable names, what's up with that? That's sort of a Microsoft thing, why the hell would you do that? Then we have Python, which I believe is the one true language, um, and everyone should follow it. Um, and we have Ruby, which is actually a cult, I think. You know, once people start in Ruby, it's sort of like they become Scientologists. <laughs> then we have uh, functional languages as well. You know, so we had Haskell, and you know, basically it's APL moving into Algol 68 for the 21st century. Woo Pretty obscure, but you'll get that one. Uh, and Clojure, and you know, Clojure is a great language as well. It's got lots of brackets, so that was cool in the 70s. And Ruby is, sort of says it's a functional language, but it's still a cult. So programming is hard. And, you know, yeah, let's go shopping. You know, the generation below us, the Generation Y and Generation Z and all that, really don't want to do this programming stuff because it's frickin' hard. And they don't, they don't want to read the frickin' manual. And also, we have this thing called quantum computing, you know, tr like Schrodinger's cat in a box. We don't know whether the bits are on or off, and it could be in all sorts of different states. And this is going to be a new paradigm. And really, there's nothing really around to really help us out. And if you think about it, all us Gen X people and that are becoming managers. You know, relationship managers, you know. So how are we going to solve this? This is really getting desperate. We're getting desperate. So I think there's an answer. Firstly is um, the Django people, I think, have got it right, the Python Django people. It's about ponies. It's about short text. It's about doing things in small characters. It's about, you know, oh my god, it's about, you know, lol cats. It's about lol speak. Therefore, the answer is lol code. A new programming language. And here's an example. Oh, hi is an opening statement. K thanks by is the closing statement. Can has standard IO is have stand input output. Visible high world is hello world. So that's the canonical hello world. That's me at promoting uh, uh, low code in Japan, by the way. One of the first low code evangelists in Japan. Uh, this is a bit more ex interesting example for various reasons. Um, Hi, can I stand? I have, I have a variable, declares a variable, I'm in your loop, up var, you know, increase by one, visible. You get the idea. This is a defined language low code. Uh, one of the beauties with low code is that there are going to be some books out for it um, already. Uh, much more interesting than PHP 6 books. Um, and basically, code repositories, we stick everything in Twitter. Because it all fits. And, what, and everyone reports their bugs in software and Twitter anyway, so that's going to work anyway. So Twitter is the future. So uh, low code is the future. Seriously, go have a look at it. Thank you very much. OK, up next we have Wycross. And going by standard rules, as soon as he attempts to plug his laptop in is when I start the timer. Oh, that's exciting. I'm starting you now, then. There's your mic. <laughs> right. Uh, so I don't have any slides, but I'm going to be talking about five interesting uh, languages that you've probably never heard of in five minutes. Um, so the first language I'm going to mention, and these are just brief mentions because I don't have time to go into them, but feel free to Google and whatnot. Uh, the first language is OOC. It's a language uh, similar to, most similar to Go, I think. Uh, it's Object-oriented, a little bit of functional, very lightweight and clean syntax, and it has type inference, so you don't have all, this, all these types floating around in your code. It's got um, support for generics. It's low-level-ish. It has a very good FFI with C, so it's very easy to call C libraries and things from it. Um, the implementation is in itself uh, self-hosting. Uh, the current implementation, uh, which compiles to native code was originally um, compiled off a Java implementation which was implemented in Java and there's a new and better implementation currently in the works. Uh, so currently it compiles out to C code and then that gets compiled out into native code. There are plans to back that onto LLVM. 
Um, the next language I want to mention is Disciple. It's similar to Haskell. Uh, the syntax is actually a fork of Haskell. Um, it's like Haskell, but it's not lazy. Um, it reduces uh, Monad use for state and I.O. purposes because what it does is it tracks all of the, um, it's got effects typing, so it tracks all of the side effects in the type system itself. So it still remains pure without actually you having to wrap your head around uh, using I.O. and state, which can thread through your code and be a little bit ugly. Uh, it's currently implemented in Haskell, but there are plans to write it in itself as well. Uh, currently compiles out to C, but there is also an LLVM backend in the works for it, uh, and it's sharing code with the GHC Haskell compiler for the LLVM backend stuff. Um, the third language I want to mention is Clay. It's a little bit similar to languages like BitC or Rust, which maybe you've never heard of either. Uh, which is, are also maybe roughly along the same lines as, say, Go or OOC. Um, it's designed to be very fast, a sort of systems programming language. It's, f it's designed to be low level. It doesn't have sort of high level constructs, but it does have type inference and is designed for very generic programming. Uh, so it has a very, very clean, lightweight syntax. And it's also designed to have a very low memory runtime overhead. Uh, and it compiles out to LLVM as well. Uh, the fourth language I'd like to mention is Phantom. That's with an F. Uh, and it's similar to sort of Java, C Sharp in syntax, but better. Um, it's portable with different implementations. It's a little bit of an OO functional. Um, hybrid language, uh, you've got a choice of static or dynamic typing if you want one or the other or both. Um, it's vaguely Java-ish, C-sharp-ish, but again, the syntax is a lot cleaner. Um, it compiles out to JVM bytecode, so you can run it in Java land. It compiles out to CLR bytecode, so you can run it in .NET land. And it compiles out to JavaScript code, so you can run it in your browser. Uh, the final language I'd like to mention is called Raya, that's R-E-I-A. Uh, it's similar to Ruby and Erlang, because it's actually kind of a hybrid of both. Um, it's a Ruby-like language that runs on the Erlang VM. Um, and it's designed to integrate seamlessly with the Erlang ecosystem. So if you kind of like the idea of Erlang and of all, all of its message passing stuff and all of its cool distributed computing stuff, but you really hate the prologue-inspired syntax, which is understandable, uh, you can use Rayo, which is, gives you a nice little Ruby sort of syntax. Um, and it compiles out to an Erlang AST, which is then transformed to bytecode by the Erlang compiler. And that's it. Oh, and by the way, all of these projects are actually under active development. They might not have a large amount of developers. Some of them only have one main active developer, but they are being actively maintained. So Google them, check them out, have fun. Okay, up next, Peter Leon. Oh, you sneaky buggers. We've got two consecutive speakers using the same laptop. They're trying to game the system. <laughs> I'll just reduce their timer down to four minutes 30. You ready to go? Well, you've plugged in. You've attempted to plug in. You might need to switch your mic on. Uh, my, name's, my name's Pete Leong. I'm a com uh, computer programmer. I specialize in, in Java. Uh, that enables me to come to conferences uh, such as LinuxConf because it w runs in most places. Um, <laughs> um, now, I've, um, I'm wrapping up a, a project shortly. <laughs> I'm wrapping up a project shortly uh, that uh, I wrote a fairly, fairly advanced swing application. Now, I learned a lot of stuff that I'd like to sort of take with me, but of course I'm going to lose access to the code base. So I've gone home and done a clean room implementation of just some little techniques that I've been using. So, let's touch it. Okay. Um, anyway, um, some of those techniques are, um, one is dynamic subclassing to, to clean up the code, and it's actually a bit of a mind-bending uh, thing to do, for me anyway. Uh, you can reduce a lot of code clutter using that. And using that, you can use a, a number of other techniques. Uh, such as right click, uh, cleans up hourglass and weight cursors. Um, and a couple other techniques, uh, you know, some threading, 
some new tech, uh, some new uh, classes in, in Java 6, and um, just some, some some minor things like Jay Goody's uh, form layout, and uh, I don't remember the ones that are on there. <laughs> I feel like I should do a dance or something because it's about the source code, really. Um, anyway, if you have a look on the wiki, there'll be a, uh, there'll be a hyperlink to uh, the source code. It'll be all online. Um, some other useful techniques were uh, dependency injection using annotations, uh, injection of fields. Um, it... Uh, what else is there? Let's see what else. Um, great. E. Uh, yeah. So uh, another a number of other uh, useful, uh, you know, guideline implementations in this piece of source code is, uh, yeah, Maven. If for those of you who aren't that familiar with it, and uh, you know, using annotations to inject logging, so you don't have to duplicate, say, class names everywhere, that sort of thing. Um, can we pull up? Can we pull up IntelliJ? Yeah. No. Okay. Anyway, so, so if you just have a look at that website there, um, that information on that project will be up very, very soon. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> you do. <laughs> so thank you for that fantastic lightning talk. How to reboot yeah. a Linux laptop in three minutes. Okay, so up next we have Steve Dalton, and he's going to start now. I don't have any slides, I was just doing some blatant self-promotion there. Um, I was just quickly going to talk about developer podcasts. Um, when I was about 15, 16, I was like the shyest kid at school, I didn't talk to anyone, and um, I don't know what happened, but sometime between then and now, I've become a really talkative person, if people know me, I just talk and talk and talk. And then me and a friend, uh, Craig Aspinall, we uh, lost my car there once in Rabina when we were at a Java meetup and it took us about an hour and a half to find the car. And we had this massive long chat and we said, this is so cool, we should do a podcast with this. So we just started um, doing a bit of a podcast called Coding by Numbers. Um, but what's kind of come out of this is we've, it's been a great little intro and we've been talking to all sorts of interesting people. We've been working our way through all the different programming languages and it's been um, really good. And what I'm noticing is there's not very many developer podcasts and not many here in Australia as well. So I guess I was just doing this lining talk to encourage you guys to um, get out and talk to people in your community, whether it, but um, things that aren't just text and Twitter and chat rooms, um, there's not much of that. Um, so the podcast has been really good. I went to Sydney last week for a bit of a holiday and I thought while I'm there I might as well see who I can talk to. Got to talk to Andrew Gerrand about Google Go. He was talking here today. I don't know if he's here. You Andrew? No? Um, went and talked to the Atlassian guys about Bitbucket. Normally I would never get to go to the Atlassian offices but because I had the podcast and they sort of wanted to promote their thing and I got to, wanted to talk to them. Um, worked out really nicely, so we're gradually working our way through all the languages. We've done Go, Java, Go, Groovy, uh, JavaScript, Ruby. Uh, haven't done Python. Code. Haven't done Python. Yeah, Log Code. Um, yeah, we did talk about Log Code at TechEd, didn't we? Uh, and yeah, I got invited to TechEd by Nick. And we talked to some of the Microsoft guys there about Azure and all sorts of things. I haven't done one on PHP or Python yet, so if anyone wants to come talk to me, I'll try and bring my recorder tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other weird languages? I'd love to talk to someone about Phantom, if, uh, who was the guy that mentioned Phantom before? Because uh, I've only just started looking at that myself. But yeah, come and grab me and I'll try and bring I've got a little MP3 recorder. It's a, called a Zoom H3, H4, which a lot of podcasters use. We started off just using the Mac. Uh, it worked pretty well. Um, but then I liked the fact I could get out there in the street. So I bought one of these little recorders. It was like 200 bucks and it's been fantastic. We don't edit the podcast at all. We just put it out there. We have a very simple little header and footer that we put on the end. And 
we get them out usually within a day of doing the podcast. Keep it really simple, and then you'll you'll get to level t- episode 20 like us. So a lot of people, I think, go too fancy, and they'll do two, three, four, and then they give up. So keep it really simple. I know some people have got like 200 episodes, and they all say the same thing, keep it simple. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Just um, put, this, put, put it in uh, over to you, and if anyone wants to come on our show, you can, but uh, by the same token, anyone wants to set up their own podcast it's really easy we just put our podcast on blogger we don't even bother with hosting or anything it's just dead simple i've just got an ftp driver i chuck all the mp3s out and then itunes is dead simple to hook up through uh, feed burner it's really no work at all so that's all i've got to say thank you very much okay so up next we have dan bentley Your time has already started. All right. Hey, uh, my name. Hey, my name's Dan Bentley, and my computer is not being cooperative. But I promise, I just hit enter on a command, which hopefully at some point I will get to show you. But uh, right now, I am going to try and talk about uh, a library called Google App Utils Python, um, and there's a link in the wiki page, which you can check out and go to. This is a library that we've developed at Google that makes it easy for Python apps to work well. So you have a flagged infrastructure and a command infrastructure and better debugging and all sorts of just nice odds and ends that we found useful. Um, But what's important uh, for what I'm saying right now is that it's developed internally at Google. And in fact, there are a lot of Googlers who contribute to it and have no idea that it's actually open source. Uh, and in fact, has anyone here heard of it? No, of course not. Um, but you should because it's pretty handy. And as a result of it being open source, you might go, well, hey, if it's developed internally, how do updates get out to the, the public? Um, and that's a really good question. And in fact, that's been pretty hard. So I've worked on a tool called Make Open Easy that allows you to uh, automate this process. So what I started was a command to take the updates that have been made internally at Google and then move them into public subversion. And this is just not detecting the displays at all, is it? Um, No. So right now I'm running a command that's going through and rerunning the automated translation process. So it's taking what's in uh, the Google internal repository. But we can't just copy and paste that out to public subversion. Why not? because there's a lot of things we have to change. There's a lot of code that was necessary in 2004 that isn't anymore. And there's no need to saddle the public with that. But we would like to give you the good stuff. So what hits subversion is the idealized version of what we'd like to do, but which we can't just remove the code that some binary somewhere is still depending on. Um, And I hope that I'll be able to, within my five minute time span actually show you that there's a new change. Has anyone found the link in uh, the wiki and gone to the Google code page? So if you follow that, there's a sources and then there's a changes. uh, And you can see that right now there are five changes. Uh, And if all goes well, there's about to be a sixth change. Um, Yeah, do you have any hints of how? Yeah, that's, I I told it to do that. it's, it seemed like it, it would. Yes. Um, so, so that's all right. You know, sometimes technology doesn't work out, right? It's the tech conference. Technology never works here. Yeah. Um, but does anyone have a, a laptop they could bring up real quick just that has a web browser so I could show off? Because this is something I'm actually proud of where I'm going to... Yeah, thank you. Um, hopefully be able to so yeah could you just go to a code.google.com it would should I just type great so I'm just going to go to code.google.com slash p slash google app utils python which is uh, a mouthful I know and that's going to load, and I'm going to get the cursor, 
<laughs> under control, because this is a very weird angle that you're actually not. And you can see here. Straight in front of you. Oh, yeah, straight in front of you. Oh, yeah, there's, wow, crazy. Microphone. <laughs> All right, and this is a microphone, and it amplifies what I say. Um, and you can see here that this is a revision that was created uh, within the past five minutes. We took the latest tip that was in uh, Google's internal servers, and we pushed it out. Uh, Daniel Nadasi and I will be talking about this and many more challenges and solutions to them at a talk on Friday called Opening a Closed World, where we want to sort of talk about how to take a closed source project and make it a successful open source project, which is a challenge not everybody has, but some people do. So if you're interested, we'd love to tell you and we'd love to hear from you how you do it well. Uh, thank you. Okay, so up last we have Brian McKenna. Usual rules apply. Your time has started. All right. All right. Has everyone heard of LLVM before? A couple of people? Okay, well, LLVM, as, um, as the acronym actually is, it's uh, the low-level virtual machine. So it's a virtual machine, but it's so low-level that you can implement uh, pretty much any uh, language uh, on it. Um, so here's the home page for LLVM. Um, so the virtual machine actually um, can compile C to the bytecode, and then that bytecode can then run on the virtual machine. So that allows you to have kind of like semi-portable um, uh, code, and you can have it you can have it run across you know Linux, Mac, and uh, Windows. So what I've found is a project called mscripten. Um, I've filed a couple of um, issues before, and I've submitted a couple of patches, so uh, I've been helping out a little bit. But um, yeah, this is a project that converts LLVM bytecode into JavaScript. So then you can run C programs on the web. So this here, well, this is Python in the browser. So what we've done is we've compiled Python from source code, C source code, put it into a static library, compiled it from C to LLVM bytecode, then compiled LLVM bytecode to JavaScript. And it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we can execute it. And this is all client side. This, is on the, this isn't on the server or anything. This is seven, I think it's about a seven meg binary. <laughs> Of, of JavaScript, <laughs> seven megabyte of JavaScript running on Chrome, um, and it works fairly well. Um, of course, we've only got the Sys library because otherwise we'd have to go to a file system, and there's no file system. Um, but yeah, we can do print, um, and we can do. We, it's Turing complete, right? Uh, you should be yes. Uh, I think the only I/O we've got is print. Sorry? Don't need anything else then. No, you don't need. Um, another demo we've got is Lua. Um, exactly the same as Python. Uh, this one's a little bit, I think it's only like three megs. So three megs of JavaScript. Um, Turing complete again. And this one is, uh, what's this one? Uh, ray tracing. So it's a C <laughs> ray tracing compiled to JavaScript. Then we're doing some. I don't know, we're doing some tricky stuff to make it actually render as a canvas element. So, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> so, um, I'll just quickly go over what, some people might not understand what's quite happening here. So this is, um, a LVM compiler um, in the, oh, sorry, server side. So we can put in C program and it puts out the LLVM bytecode. So you can see all that down there. So what we do is we get a human readable version just like this. 
we do some JavaScript parsing on it and then convert it to just like a little JavaScript virtual machine that runs in the browser. And that's how it works. The end. Okay, so we've got six minutes left and that was the last lightning talk. So I'm going to go open mic now. Does anybody want to show something off that they've, um, that they've been working on or something like that? No takers? Uh, presumably your VGA port. <laughs> the time has started. Cool, right, that's cool a terminal. <laughs> well, uh, so There's a screen in front of you. Ah, uh, yes, very good. So, I work on a project called... Use your microphone. microphone. Um, I, work this on, one? Yeah. I work on a project called Beaker, which is not the Muppet. <laughs> <laughs> You're searching yeah. videos. Oh, whoops. There's a screen in front of you. Yes, I know. <laughs> I can't. Okay, so... Beaker. Um, Beaker is essentially, uh, it helps you to build a test infrastructure. Um, it's used for when you need to test things with various different distros on various different hardware. Um, essentially what it provides is, is it will allow you to create a pool of systems which can be located anywhere in the world um, and, it, and, and it also provides you a pool of distros. Um, which it can pull from um, an, an NFS server or something. So what you can do is if you've got a new kernel that you want to release and you don't have a one terabyte machine below your desk, um, but yet they do have one, say, somewhere in the States that, um, that they have on this pool, you can actually test your code and, and, and create custom tests which, will, um, which you can run against um, the kind of hardware that you need and the kind of distros that you want to test it against. So, so it solves the problem of, of um, you know, having to have all, these loc um, um, all of these local um, machines which um, you know, could get quite expensive if you've got to have all these machines um, over all these very different, um, various different hardware types and architecture types. Um, you can solve it by having them in one central place and people all over the world can actually use this pool to test them. It uses Cobbler on the back end. You can, um, you can power machines on and off. Once you've provisioned it with a distro, you can SSH in if you want, or you can just run your automated testing. The testing will then, um, if you've written it correctly, it will provide results. You can go and view those results, see how many passed, how many failed. You can look at logs, you can see what's passed, what's failed, and then you can go and investigate and see what's wrong. So this ensures, this is actually what Red Hat uses. This is, um, this is what we use um, to, you know, New kernel comes out, we want to um, test uh, a new distro, we fire it up against S390s, um, um, all sorts of hardware to make sure it works. Um, so we, this is actually, it's, a, it's an open source project obviously. Um, it, it was previously a closed source project which we only used internally. We re it, uh, re rewrote it completely in Python, it uses um, turbo gears, it's got a, it's got a browser front end. Um, so yeah, and it, and, it, and it works quite well for us. Um, I'm working in a team of about five people and we're very heavily um, working on it. Um, you can also, if you want, you can, use, um, you can use it just as a system inventory if you want. And if you've got another application um, which, which, um, which um, runs your tests and, um, and um, gives you your results, you can just plug into Beaker and just have your system sit in Beaker's inventory um, and then just... Um, um, you know, take them from there. So it does that as well. Um, some of the features we've got coming up will um, be adding um, Apache Cupid support, so it'll be able to fire off messages when um, different events happen. So, say like Bugzilla could could um, listen in and you know say, okay, well this test has been run, it's completed, blah blah. We can you know um, change a condition against it. Um, any questions?
No? Okay. That's it. So, oh yeah, so you can do something like if you're interested in it, um, want to uh, develop on it, we hang out on Freenode in Hashbeaker. Um, the documentation is reasonable, it's quite, it's reasonably easy to set up. Um, so yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so that's all we've got time for this evening. So that's the end of the Open Programming Minicomp for this year. Has everybody enjoyed it? Hey, good. Okay, so um, just quickly on indulgence, uh, thank you to all the um, thank you to all the volunteers who've helped out with manning the rooms uh, today. Uh, running the second uh, roving mic for the um, for the questions has saved me from running around like an idiot today, which is great. Uh, thank you to everybody who's presented, especially to the people who haven't presented at LCA before. Um, you've definitely made this mini comp absolutely fantastic, and thank you to the papers committee for. Yes. <laughs> I should have reloaded, shouldn't I? Thank you to the Papers Committee for permitting me to run this mini-conf again. Um, this is the second time we've run this particular mini-conf and apparently it didn't go too badly last time so um, they, gave the, they had the faith in me to run it again and I'm very, um, very thankful for that opportunity. Uh, and thank you to the audience for coming along. I hope you've enjoyed the day. And we have to thank Chris organizing this minicon. Big, huge thank you, Chris. And we, it's a small token of uh, appreciation. Thank you. A rather cool bowl made out of macadamia. Right, see you all tomorrow.